Good morning. Thank you very much for having me today to interview you. Thanks for having me join you. That's great. So we are going to talk about uh, your life today and your career path that you took uh, from your young young life to now. Sure. Uh, I believe you are 69 years old now. 69 every day of it. Wow. <laughs> that, that's a that's a that's a very uh, what you can see, you are just before 70. Yes, I am. Uh, it's, uh, it's hard to believe that you can age this quickly. It seems like it just flies by. Oh, yeah. So, uh, let's start with your career. What was the last job that you did and when did you retire? Well, I, the last organization I worked for was Fidelity Investments. I worked for them for about 15 years. Um, and I started in the world area of supply chain and um, there was a large vendor base that they used and I was on the back side of the business there. It was financial services and we dealt with other financial firms but the role I was in was more of a, a support role to make sure that we were opera operationally efficient and uh, I did that for as I said, 15 years or so, uh, with different roles in between, in there uh, somewhere. But uh, about five years ago, I retired and uh, was offered a package with uh, many other Fidelity executives, and they were actually trying to uh, narrow the top-heavy structure of the organization. They ended up bringing in more people but at lower levels and got rid of much of their, uh, a good number of executive level positions, um, basically for operational efficiency and overhead and, um, you know, it was a successful uh, process for the firm and I think it changed and, and changed many retirees' lives but also changed and presented opportunities for many people in the organization. Wow, great. Yeah. So it's been like five years for you. Yes. Uh, how, how has it been to you, five years? Uh, you know, the first, um, first year on vacation, every day is Saturday. You know, that's pretty spectacular, a little hard getting used to. Um, and then there's a second phase of that where you have some boredom. Because when you're in a working role, your heads, for many of us, you know, your heads and your activities are uh, 24-7. Every day you're working, you're thinking, you're doing this, and your day's off, sometimes you're even thinking about work. So when that kind of stops, that's, uh, gee, how am I going to fill my time? How am I going to fill my activity? How am I going to keep my brain going? So uh, that adjustment, I managed. I got through it. But I, I continue to have, you know, little projects and things that I do relative to keeping my mind busy and my head busy and, uh, excuse me, my mind and my hands busy. And, uh, you know, I'm enjoying retirement. Great. So back when you were younger, did you ever visualize that your retirement would be like this? No, I never thought of retirement. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I, I've had um, many jobs and many careers and, and moved to multiple companies, um, I liked the changes and the process of learning and meeting different people along the way and uh, educating them and being educated and, and I think that was the process. So I, I didn't, uh, I liked work. I liked working. So I still like to work. There is a word called enriching, where you also learn from other people and you also enrich other people with your knowledge. Yes. And that's a very interesting and beautiful experience and I think that is one of the important um, aspects of life mm. which keeps keep people going. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, uh, the, one of the things that was enriching and one of the things was having, meeting people, working with people, mentoring, tutoring people, um, and also learning along the way. So uh, I think the ability to engage with others, uh, learn from others, is a gift. Yes, yes, very nice. 
So, um, in Fidelity, when you were working, uh, was it something to do with the retire uh, the four hundred one k that they offer to different companies? Were you in that particular department? So no, I was not. Uh, Fidelity has four different uh, major functions. What most people know them for is the retirement side, the 401k, right. the retirement investment side. They also have a personal investing side where mm -hmm. you know they have the Fidelity offices and you might have your own investment. Mutual funds. Yes, mutual funds. And then they have uh, uh, an institutional side of the business which supported all the back office and trading activities of the two other branches of their business. Okay. And um, w that's the side of the business I was in, kind of the back side of the business. The institutional side also uh, is very active at the commercial banking levels and, and supporting your Wall Street and other firms and oh. balancing cash for the nice. firm. But my role was all the vendor support and the software and the, the mechanical process of we were responsible for every time you made a trade to make sure that the trade confirmations, the letters, the legal letters and mailings that all are supported with financial trades and uh, business transactions that the documents got there either electronically or paperwise. And all those monthly statements that people get in the mail and never open because they used their online account. We used to mail all those. You are the guy who <laughs> sent that mail, so many mails and letters. Yes. I yeah. see. Yes. And, and you know, there's a, there's a good reason for it, uh, for the Fidelity people and for the people. It's for their protection. Uh, but those rules and regulations are set by FINRA, which is a financial organiz a control organization. And they set the standards of what you're going to get, when you're going to get it, and you know what liabilities they have as a firm for trading and making recommendations for financial uh, services. So um, without those controls, people could be uh, cheated, and mm -hmm. that's not a good thing. So. Okay. You have any advice on what should we do with the paper statements? Uh, well, I think people should use the online version. Okay. And if you want a paper statement, all you have to do is hit boom on your printer and you can have it because it's all right there. Okay. So uh, it's kind of the reason they have them and they haven't converted is uh, tradition, right? And it will eventually change. Okay. Uh, over you know, my career at Fidelity when I started there uh, in the early 2000s, I'd say it was about 80% paper, 20% electronic. Okay. Uh, it has moved to over 60% electronic. Oh, with great. Over, with maybe 40% paper-based. Uh, there isn't any real reason for the paper other than great. traditions. Great. But, you know, people like it. Uh, it's, there's many organizations that are seeking to put it all... Uh, I fall victim to it. I could have many of my statements mailed to... Uh, sent to me electronically for credit cards and others and I won't do it because when I get the paper in the mail it reminds me to pay the bill. Correct, <laughs> <laughs> so, correct. I'm old school. Right. So uh, tell me about how did you grow in the organization since you joined Fidelity? How was that journey? Uh, so um, well I think from Fidelity, I was lucky enough to come into that organization at a vice president level. Hmm. So um, that was a position of a large responsibility. Um, I came to the organization uh, through an acquaintance I had met at a previous uh, uh, company. Uh, we worked together for five years in our little organization and about we part, you know, the companies went somewhere, he went places, I went places. And he called me back because of, uh, he called me and said, would you be interested in moving to Ohio and, uh, or Kentucky, you know, out in this way and work for Fidelity in a role, I know you'd be great at it. I'm like, I don't really want to move to Ohio. And he goes, Jeff, at your age, 
I'm not going to end up calling you again. You should really think about it. Because <laughs> I was in my early 50s. And he said, you know, it's, it's that much harder to get a job after your, and change jobs after you're 50. You should really think about it. This is a real fantastic organization. And uh, as I thought about it and listened to him, his counsel, um, and I said, you know, that's, a, that's probably a good move. So as I went there, uh, as I said, I was a vice president, but my role within those years changed and as the organization changed. So as we moved from a very paper-based organization and paper-centric, we moved to electronic. And that electronic involved a whole different uh, operational processes, people, engagement in technology, um, opportunities for us to, uh, Fidelity had been around for a number of years, and what made them great was they did all their own internal development of systems and applications, and it was some of the best in the world. But 20 years later, all those platforms needed to be rejiggered. And how do you do it? And how do you keep up with the change? So instead of developing it all internally, they started partnering with people on the outside. So they went to best-in-class solutions for all the various areas. And that involved you know, myself for vendor relationships and processes and contracts and making sure that that was there. So along the way, uh, although my title moved around, uh, it was still at a vice president level. And that was uh, fantastic for me, but it gave me an opportunity to meet so many different people in the organization, bring in staff, change staff. Um, you know, Fidelity's always in a growth position. Very few people will go uh, because it's a good organization, but they will move. You know, when opportunities present themselves, they will find ways. So um, we found ourselves being kind of the quiet, silent type in the background. Uh, you know, what we did operationally, because Fidelity is known for its financial services. And many people in our side of the business then moved to other areas, the 401k, the retail side, on the phones, working with uh, the institutional side. So uh, that organization ha has done very well, uh, will continue to do well because they adapt and change to the marketplace. That's great. Yeah. Uh, was there any uh, situation or event that happened in your uh, last job which you held on to 15 years which kind of tested you? to your core. That it tested me to my core? Yeah, like yeah. difficult situations where you have to really apply all your brain cells and abilities to make sure you get through that situation smoothly. Yeah. Uh, I'd yeah. say that one of the toughest ones was I was the guy who led the outsourcing operation to discontinue our print uh, facilities and we outsourced it. And that resulted in over 200 roles being eliminated. Got it. That was trying. Mm. Uh, one, it was trying because people didn't want to do it from top to bottom. Nobody wanted the personal effect, you know, the impacts to the people, the this, the that. But the organization was top quality in the way it handled it, dealt with the people, and you know, found opportunities for many of the people to move to other areas. And we engaged with a firm that, um, you know, was the best in the industry. Uh, we doubled their size. We were one of the biggest as a private uh, printing organizations in the, in the country for wow. that services. So when we outsourced it to a partner, it was a big project. Oh, that, yeah. was, that was my project. Um, I'm the one who brought it forward to senior management. I'm the one who uh, took it forward relative to the implementation and then took over the management of the supplier network after that until I retired. Yeah. And now, several people do it, so it's good. <laughs> <laughs> most yeah. of which, most of them worked for me at one point in time, but you know, they had, they acquired the experience over the years. And so five years later, I still know the people running that process. Mm -hmm. I can imagine how difficult that would be. It was it was very trying at the time. Uh, what was interesting is uh, 
besides the people impact and the difficulty of the process, it, it had to be done without flaws or failures. Oh. No customer impact. And that process of uh, extreme detail, testing, uh, you know, the controls that were in place while you're still working a day-to-day -day operation. So they didn't do that in one day. That took about 12 months to move all of the 400 products to the vendor, but it was trying. <laughs> it was trying. It was fun though. I see. So the major benefit for them, for Fidelity's point of view, is to be able to focus on their own core core business instead of Correct. worrying about the printing aspect and, right. and so mailing them. Just that. It was just that, right? What do we want to be the best at? What, you know, again, you know, one of the challenges, right, was the changes in technology, the speed, the engineer, all the things that are there. It was time to re-platform millions of dollars of printing machines and equipment. These, these printers are not the printers that you see at your office. These are printers that print on rolls that are eight feet high. Oh. And you know, we would mail 20 million pieces of statements a month. You know, I mean, it would, it's just the massive volumes and the number of printers and the technology that did it was amazing. But what people wanted was the same experience that they could get online on paper. And so, you know, you wanted variable content, you wanted color, you wanted all the things that when you called up your cell phone, it's like, well, you can't, these, these need to be the same. And to do that, to have that same customer experience, they would have needed to rewrite all the software, buy all new hardware, run this thing out, and it would be a, a very expensive project. It was expensive to move it, but now the supplier who was already in that, that uh, mode of updating and doing all that is the one doing that spending, and we're taking and concentrating, uh, when I say we, Fidelity, uh, took the time now to say, hey, what do I want to be good at? Right. Yeah, so. Great. Wow. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that experience. Yeah. So let's go a little back in history. Sure. What was the job that you did before working for Fidelity? Oh boy. So uh, when I when I uh, graduated from college, it was a very down market. It was the late seventies, right? This was coming out of gas crisis, depression, the highest. Similar to what we see today, with the highest, you know, the period when people are saying we have the highest inflation rates since when? That's when I was getting out of school. <laughs> I see. So, uh, my first, you know, graduated from school, graduated with an honors and a high GPA, and said, you know, education is going to be the answer. And when I got out, I sent out probably, no, I'm not exaggerating, five to six hundred letters, resumes. Because they didn't do anything online at the time. It was all oh, paper. Oh, right? yeah. Right? So it was all paper. That was a project. You know, I was all over New England working my way. And I received five to seven responses out of five or six hundred you wow. know, letters and whatever. And maybe two interviews. And everybody said, well, that's great, but, our, you know, things are so bad. We can't oh. Do so after, you know, so. What did you graduate in? Let me interrupt. 1975. You. From, you, from college, and so then I said, "What was your graduation degree in?" Uh, I was finance. I was a finance BS in finance. BS in finance. Yeah, I was, in 1975. Yes. Wow. And then uh, I said, "Gee, no job." I had some other people that I was went to school with, and they were taking jobs, but they weren't jobs in their line of in their line of work. What they had studied for and done this and done that. And I said, "I'm not going to do it." So I went and got my graduate degree, <laughs> and I said, if I'm going to not work, I'm going to use this time, you know, to go get my uh, master's degree. How much was your fee during that time? My free fees? Fees, school fees. Oh, minimal compared to what we pay today. I, I'd have a, a hard time remembering, but it seemed like a lot at the time. But like, still, how much was it? What was the number? 
twelve thousand a year. Twelve thousand a year, yeah. or at that time? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It was a lot. Then. It was a lot at that time. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, today uh, you can get through one semester for like about that amount, six thousand. You know, Maybe well, you're saying too high. Yeah. I think it might be a little high because I think, I think the whole thing when I got done, <laughs> when I added my education and graduate degree and whatever, I had spent somewhere thirty-five to forty thousand dollars. Oh wow! Yeah, you know? and so. Did you, were you able to get a loan at that time? Or? Oh, there was no loans involved. No loans. Yeah, we just paid cash one way. <laughs> <laughs> there was some small loans, but yeah. But did, so your parents helped you? Well, they did, and I paid them back. So okay. the loans were that. You know, there was a, you know, they agreed to pay for my undergraduate degree. And okay. For my graduate degree, that was all mine because oh. they wanted me to get a job. And I wanted to get a job, but I didn't want to undersell myself. Uh, I had a couple of opportunities, but they were thousands of dollars less than what, uh, you know, like, not, not like a couple thousand, they were like six to eight thousand dollars a year less than what I was shooting for, for, you know, a BS and finance degree. And uh, so uh, I what? said no. So I went and got my, my graduate degree and a uh, year and a half to two years later, the market was better, and I found a role at a company. In uh, I turned, I, I took a role as a financial systems implementation project manager. Wow! And basically, in I, two years, you become a project manager. Well, I wasn't a project manager. You know, they might have called it a project manager. Basically, I was an uh, implementation point person. Okay. So what was happening is this was a, a the company was an ITT company, which nobody's ever heard of, an international telephone and telegraph. It was one of the biggest organizations in the country or the world, right? They had a, it was a conglomerate with all kinds of holdings. So this this organization was putting in a new financial management and inventory control model through all of their thirty six locations across the United States. I had uh, the region of Northeast and Southeast, uh, but we ended up traveling all over the country. So we went through uh, a six to eight week implementation. We went to their branch, you managed the whole thing with the technology people and the finance people, and you drove all of the changes and drove the new systems testing, finished to end, and then you're on to the next. What are the region. product? Well, it's interesting. The product that they sold uh, was probably really base material. Have you ever heard of cast iron? And yes. Weld fittings and you know things like that and sprinkler pipe and all. So the name of the company was Grinnell. Um, they were one of the uh, largest manufacturers and distributor of pipes, valves, and fittings in the United States. They had uh, eight to ten manufacturing firms across and foundries uh, across the United States, and they had a network of 38 branches in the United States and 12 in Canada, and they could get a truckload of product to 97 percent of the American and Canadian population in 24 hours. Wow! So it was big. I didn't know it. It was you know, it, but it was big for me, and it was a great job. I got to travel, I got to meet a ton of people, got to, you know, practical experience on deadlines, deliveries, and introducing yourself, rolling out a project, working on a thing, you know, calling people, then calling you at night, you know, saying, how do I get through this? So you worked hard, um, and then after that project was over, I went to work at their uh, headquarters, and I was a senior financial analyst, which basically said month end, quarter end, when they're buying money, spending, if they were using any capital plan, uh, financial analysis, that was my role. So that gave me the opportunity to go from, you know, that's what I went for for my degree, but my foot in the door was, I'm going to go with financial systems and implementations and travel around, meet the people I could meet, and go for that next job. Oh, okay. So uh, I want a little move a little back. So you. Did your undergrad in finance, and what what was your 
uh, degree when you did the graduation? Uh, called a Bachelor of Science degree in finance. Bachelor in Bachelor of Science degree in finance. Yeah. And then you got into this company which made the five fittings and all other things. And you were uh, working for them for how long? Nine years. Nine years. And that was your first big job that you did? That was my first real big job. Okay. And uh, you were looking at operations point of view, right? From operations point of view, but from with a financial view. Right. Not with the day-to-day, -day, uh, like logistics or something like that. But it was all about... Money. Yeah, it was about the money. It, it turned out to be, I learned about materials management, inventory management, product management, you know, marketing along the way, technology, but it gave me a foot in the door to learn a company and see all aspects of that. And then I got to do what I went to school for. And you know what I found out after I did that for five or six years? I was better at the other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I worked for them in, in increasing roles of accountability. I went from the financial analyst role, senior analyst role, moved over to uh, you know, they came to me and said, uh, Billy Bob's leaving and we'd like you to be this, you know, take over this department. And okay. Said, okay, so I take over that materials management role and then I took over, uh, which related back to the systems work I had done before because they knew I knew the product and I knew how to do this. So they, they said it would be a great opportunity for me to do that. And then while I was there, they said, gee, can you take on the purchasing people? Uh, that guy's leaving. Can you take this on? And can you do that? So what would happen is people would move on in advance, and I would try to get more. How do I get more, and how do I learn more, and how do I take more more, and more accountability? Uh, and then I got an offer to, uh, to move to a branch location in Dallas. And at the time, my daughter was uh, receiving medical assistance and cert had multiple surgeries and she was under the care of the Shriners Hospital and we couldn't make that move. So it was just too much of a change. So uh, I stayed with the organization and didn't move to Dallas, which uh, the location in Dallas is now one of the largest in the country. Yeah, I could have been a king. Oh, <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. Because of the boom that they were about to have. But, uh, you know, no could have, should have, whatever. Uh, a year or two later, um, a guy that I worked for along the way at that same company was at a different organization, and he asked me to move to New Hampshire to work with him. And it was with a footwear company, which you're going, you're going from pipes, valves, and fittings to footwear. How the heck does that work? Well, it was about systems implementation, Same finance, thing. it was, you know, project management, people, people, it, you know, it was like, how do you kind of, so the guy that calls me said, I know you did all that there. You can do all this here. It's just not. Different product, different, different people. Yeah, different product, same process. Same so process. Do that. So then I worked there as a, I, that role ended up being a, Wait, let me, let me interrupt you yeah. here. So in your first job of nine years, you have taken so many different uh, responsibilities as you uh, spend time in the organization. So was it, so let, I'm sure you had a lot of aspirations to get a promotion and yeah. you know, bigger pay package and all that. So was it that first you had to prove yourself that you're capable and worthy of the next position and you stayed in that, uh, even though you were, your role, current role was not that, but you took add on additional responsibilities. Yeah. And then the management saw that, yes, this guy is able to perform, right. and, and then they gave you pro promotion. Right. Yeah, I, I think it, it was a combination of both, but I think what, it was a combination of hard work and opportunity. So you work hard, people recognize you as a hard worker. You know, you achieve things, you do results, you're not afraid to learn. So people say, well, I would rather hire from within than hire from the outside. Okay. Sometimes that doesn't always work in the, every organization, but I think 
you know, hard work, people skills, willingness to learn is a key element of growth and success. Okay. You have to reach out and people need to know that you want more, you got to show them you can do more, and when you do, you will be rewarded. If you're not rewarded in a way that you think, then it's time to go somewhere else, uh -huh. right, and do that. I mean, you could stay there for 25 years maybe, or 30 years, or, you know, for the rest, but we, I didn't want to do the same thing I was doing for 25 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. That, to me, is not, was not enriching, uh, you know, for myself and for others. So, um, you know, when the time came for a new role, I was lucky because I had built a pretty good network of people that I knew. Um, I went to that next footwear company for another nine years. Okay. Right? And advanced, you know, my uh, career financially and responsibility-wise. And then the company was sold to Soul. Okay. And one day, <laughs> Everybody on the executive staff of this $150 million shoe organization was let go. Oh. Except me. Oh my gosh. The HR person and the CFO. Wow. And so they said, we need you to stay and, and make sure that we can transition this company. Now we knew that that was only for some period of time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was because they, they went in and just did a wholesale buyout and got rid of all the things, which was wild. And as you're the last, you know, one of the last three people there, so I made it to the second to the last. When the HR person was let go, I said, well, my time is close, right? And so uh, <laughs> it was every day I would call down to the uh, CEO, the new CEO's admin and say, is today the day? No, nope, today's not the day, Jeff, you know. It's, and then one day I said, hey, jokingly, is today the day? And the lady was silent. <laughs> and it was the day. I see. But they, didn't they offer you a job? Oh, I, I, they didn't offer me a job, but they gave me a great package. Oh. Uh, you know, with, uh, at the time, I was pretty, I think I was 40, uh, and I didn't, I didn't realize that that, that that was a good thing at the time, but it really gave me time to find out what I want to do. And, uh, you know, 40 is young, but when you're 40, you think it's old, right? And uh, so I uh, managed to get a call from somebody I knew okay. at another footwear company, and they said, we have a project that we'd like you to work on. We don't know if it's full time. I'm like, I'll be there. So, <laughs> so uh, at the time I was there, and then that project turned into a real job, and I went to work in the distribution business and set up uh, what had happened. It was a company that had a large footwear organization that made children's shoes and sports shoes, and uh, they had made a decision to go to a fully automated distribution system somewhere in the Midwest, they turned it on and it didn't work. Oh. And lo and behold, they needed to keep two facilities that they said they were going to close open for two more years or more. And they asked me to take that on and make those things operational again. And uh, that was a very challenging role because you had told people that we don't want you but we want you to stay for two more years, oh. right? And then we don't want you. Uh -huh. uh, and then, so you, had, and it was a union environment, and, uh, but it, it was great fun. Um, we had a good time, and it, we knew what the end looked like. And when that ended, uh, someone that I worked with at that organization said, hey, have you ever heard of this company? They're looking for somebody, so another, reference from a friend, got me a job at, uh, as the vice president of distribution for a company called Safety First. I don't know if anybody remembers the baby on board sign. With the yes. Yeah, yeah. That was that company. I see. And that was another turnaround, and I worked there for another five or six years oh. until that company was sold. 
So that, those things of taking on challenges and learning and accepting the reality of, okay, so what, what, what's causing all this change? Is it me? Is it, you know, like, no, but where, it, well, I won't say it wasn't me. I'm not perfect by any means, but recognizing an opportunity to say, hey, I can learn something. I can walk away from this if that's what it is. But in the meantime, I can go to another, get another type of product to support, learn some other applications, meet some other people, build your network, uh, show your value. So from there, that turned into the Fidelity job. Uh -huh. That someone that I worked with there is the guy who called me to go to Fidelity. So when people are out there networking and people are out there finding and things like LinkedIn and other tools that are out there, they mean something. Okay, before you didn't have all that technology behind you. The only thing I, 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 I would add to those that are interested in LinkedIn and networking, this, that, that, asking somebody to be your friend and asking somebody, you know, oh, I'll send you an invite, that doesn't do anything. You gotta make the connection. You gotta find the link. And you know, sometimes those things, they're nothing more than a conversation and meeting someone. And to, but someday you might meet the, and some people that you're engaged with, and the guy says, oh, I met a guy. I know, you know, he's gonna be somewhere at his kid's soccer game or doing this and he's talking to somebody else while they're having a cup of coffee and they said, you know, boy, we're having problems at our place and hey, I met a guy the other day. Hey, he might be interested. That's it. Your hours upon hours of, you know, what you think, you know, might have been great for sending out resumes and hunting the paper and those are things that keep you busy. The reality is you work on your network. You work on the people you know and the people that have been successful, you know, before and the ones that you are connected to. Work on that. That's where it's going to come from. Yeah, I have. I totally agree with what you said. I had a senior colleague, and he once told me, "It's not. It's not. It does not matter who you know. It matters who knows you." <laughs> <laughs> and I think that is the yeah. networking aspect. Yes, I agree. That's a that's a great way to put it in a short sentence, right? Yes. You know that that network uh, of trust uh, that you have with other colleagues and things about, okay, can this guy handle the, the accountability, the responsibility of this? Can he be a leader? Can he do the things? Some, sometimes that person is a yes, and sometimes it's a no. It's not a guarantee, but at least you're, you're talking to people. You can be in the run, and you'll be in the top of mind or the back of somebody's head when another opportunity comes up. So I, I think, you know, part of that is, yeah, you have to be open, approachable. You've got to, you know, be willing to talk to people and learn and take on other things and not just, well, I'll wait, I'll wait for them to come to me. Mm. You can wait. Right. But it might not, they might not come. Right. You gotta reach out. So let's talk about uh, uh, building relationships with colleagues. Anytime you go to a new organization, you meet hundreds of new people and you don't know. So how would you start about like what was you is the, was there a template kind of in your mindset after working for so many years like there is a set approach that you take? Geez, I don't know if there's a set approach as much as I believe the approach is. You know, my approach was who do I like to engage with? Uh, what kind of person are they? Do I trust them, and can they trust me? How does that trust establish when you have never worked with them? Uh, you know, I, th I think you have to build it. Right? How do you build it? Well, I think you build it through conversations or demonstrating, you know, what you can do and how you can help them. When you offer people help and provide that help, not offer help and don't do it, or not offer help and screw it up, you know, or not communicate. So part of it is that give and take of when people are like, I'll help you, but if you can't help them, you better say, hey, but I can't do it here, and I can't do it here, but I can do it here, and this is how I can help you. You know, be open and communicate, no, not just, uh, yeah, I can help you. No, I'm not. Right. That, that's right. not building that trust. That's not this, oh, to back to your point, I know him, 
Yeah, well, he knows you too. Right. He knows. <laughs> he knows that you let him down the last right, time. Right, right. So I think you know you can uh, have the experience. I still think about a, a, a gentleman I worked with in one organization that I trusted the people that worked for me, and because they were good people, and when it came down to it, they were wrong, and that guy blamed me because I gave him my word. And you know what? He was right. I took the word of these others. I passed it on. He said, you told me. Oh. I trusted you. And I still, you know, it still makes me, when I think about it, it's like, you're right. I, I screwed up because I trusted and didn't verify. You know, <laughs> you know, so it was a learning experience. Right. Not pleasant. But that's how we learn, right? Yeah. Uh, mistakes. Yeah. And then we don't try to repeat them. Yeah. I mean, you, so that didn't happen much more, right? When you, part of that is when you promise and have, you know, building that trust means, yeah, you're checking. You're, you're doing things. You're making sure you're delivering against that trust. You know, it starts with communication. It starts with a joint project or something or lunch or, you know, hey, uh, my kid is having problems with this and yeah, you ever, you know, so then you can engage in something, so. Uh, so, uh, so as you go through this uh, whole life and you meet so many people, you must have met so many people who would give a lot of word, that I'll do this, do that, do that, and maybe not keep the word. Yeah, yeah. What percentage of people are like that, do you think? Um, you know, I would, so, so part of that, I think it's small, you know, 5%. Oh, wow. 10%. But that's if you know what they're committing to, oh. right? So, I mean, part of it, know what you have the right expectation. I don't really, some people, right, they're, they're, not, they're not on the same level in knowing what the commitment was. Oh, you mean you're going to take care of my dinner bill? No, I didn't say that. I said I'd join you for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Making sure those two things are, you know, aligned, right? I think most, when they are aligned, people will perform well to that. And you have very high numbers of... So basically setting the right expectations right. and communicating clearly. Yeah. And that helps a lot. And that helps a lot. And then people both can kind of meet those expectations and when you don't do that then the expectations aren't often met because not because they're not met but they're two different very different levels so um, part of that is yeah talking talking right got it so um, can you summarize uh, what are the human qualities that one should possess who have a successful career that is as long-lasting as yours yeah well you know, I, I, I don't know all of them, but I would say you need to be a pretty good communicator. Okay. You know, you have to be willing to talk. You have to be willing to listen. And I think listening is a big, people can talk, but you know, it takes two. And so I think listening, being open, uh, open to new ideas, being a learner, a world learner, saying I want to meet, have different experiences and do something different and, and learn from it, right? It isn't necessarily pleasant, but I think that I, you know, I had a good education. Um, I will tell you that I'm a terrible reader, you know? I'm a terrible uh, communicator relative to writing a speech. And when I have to write a letter, it takes me a really long time. Okay. So my brain is going a million miles an hour and you know, I'm a little ADD. You know? Okay. You know? <laughs> so being disciplined enough to take that and say, I know what I can do well and I know what I don't do well, that's a, that's a detractor. Make sure you don't have a lot of detractors. Or if you have them, work on them to make them at least good enough so that you can excel at the stuff you're very good at. That's what people will go for. What are you very good at? So basically being authentic. 
Yes. This is, I mean, if you want to summarize this whole thing, is being authentic with yourself, yeah. with other people, so you know your abilities and you know yeah. where you are in every I sense. I think to your point, know who you are. Yes. Study who you are. Right. Know what you, it's not necessarily what you want, but you can get maybe more of what you want if you know what you're very good at mm -hmm. and what you're not that good at. So don't get a role or look for a role for things, oh wow, this, this is great money and this, that, and but it's not what you do well. And you're not going to do well. You know, so I think part of that is, as you said. And uh, so other aspect also you, which you described, I think it touches uh, integrity. Yes, yeah. I think uh, integrity is key. It goes back to that trust model. It's like giving a word and fulfilling it and keeping the word. Yeah, it means a lot. And if you cannot, then at least apologize or let them know in, in advance that yeah, you may not be able to do it. Communicate, talk Communication. About it. Yeah, because that, you know, I'm going to be there if somebody says they need your help. Mm. It's not going to be, and people know it. Yeah. So they, they will entrust me. And then if they will, I'll let them be the ones say, hey, you don't have to. You don't need to, I got it, it's just, okay, but I'm here if you need, right? So. Right. And then another word comes into me while listening to your story is responsibility, taking on responsibilities. Yeah. And increasing the plate size. Well, you have to. I think, you know, taking on that uh, added responsibility of more than just life, you know, uh, when you go for different roles and you try to be successful in life, the reason they're going to do more and pay you more is you have more responsibility and more accountability. All right. And, and you, you best be willing to take it on or you probably won't be successful. Correct. You can't at the end go, well, they did this and they, but you're here, so it all goes up. <laughs> yes. And then also I'm hearing a lot of enriching going on from beginning. Yeah. I, I, and it's still going on. Yeah. Right. So. I have for this formula called air. We need air to breathe. What is AIRE? Authenticity, integrity, responsibility, and enriching. Ah, air. Nice, very nice. With yeah. this formula, I think anybody can become successful in whichever direction of career they choose where they want to go or in life. Yeah. They will open many doors. You agree with that? I do. I do. I think that's uh, good theory and good in practice. And I think uh, you know I don't have the acronym, but I'll probably use it again. Air. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 breathing. That's good. As important as breathing. Yes. And um, so I want to uh, kind of come to an end to this interview now. Sure. Uh, but I want to make a observation. Sure. And you can tell me if my observation is close. Um, so when you are working on the finance side of this industry of any industry. You started from the steel industry, then you went to the shoe industry, and then when you went into actually money, money industry, <laughs> yeah. right? Money was the product, yeah. infidelity. So when you go through all of these different industries and your focus is on money, you learn how the products move or what is the value of product in the market and everything about the product because Ultimately, it comes to money. You learn so much about the product mm -hmm. as well as the value and the money valuation of it, right? Yeah. So, when I was, I had a mentor who told me one day that the guy who controls the money is a real powerful person. Well, I, I agree. Uh, one of the reasons I went into finance yeah, is I wanted to understand how. Yes business was really done. Where's the money? <laughs> Who's, where's it coming from? How are they committing to it? What are the things? How is it set up? And then how does that drive the rest of the organization's goals and aspirations, right? right? Because you can have all those things, but if there's no money behind it or if it's not spent in the right area. Right. So that was my goal in, in learning first that finance side of the business. And I think doing the, and learning, you know, financial analysis, the tools, the keys, the things that were used to value, you know, return and investment and other things were a key element that you use in the practicality of all operations, right? So 
I think, the, to me, you know, for that, you know, your observation that the money is key, it was key for me. It was the way that I, you know, the platform I've built off of to go through my career. And, you know, I, you know, one of the more difficult things, the outsourcing project that I worked on. Was, yes. Well, the big key to that was doing the financial analysis and the review of what it was going to take to reinvest versus what it was going to take to move and pay the costs of the move and the severance pays and all the other things. And net, net, where do you want to take the rest of the money for this organization and invest it in the future? Yeah. It's back to that kind of breakdown of how things worked and operated to me was a key. key. What I so uh, I know another person, gentleman, uh, who used to work in a similar uh, financial analyst role. But he used to uh, work for, for banks who give away loans yeah. and um, for large earth moving equipments. Sitting in that role, he understood how the whole earth moving industry works. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and after a couple of years, he said, you know what, I'm going to own my own earth moving industry because I have the full knowledge of this industry now. Mm -hmm. Because I know how the money works here. And I know about that equipment. I may not be an engineer, but I know how the fan, I know how how I can make profit yeah. out of this. Yeah. So so, and he really runs a great uh, successful organization back in India, cool. and uh, in Africa, and he has like more than hundred earth moving equipments, yeah. and he and his wife are running it for like last uh, ten years, cool. because he came from finance. Yeah. So something like that. Did it ever cross your mind to have your own something different? Like, uh, based on the knowledge that you accumulated, your own company? Um, it, it didn't really because I was very, very, I mean, it, it could have, should have, maybe, but I was pretty involved in all of the businesses that I was in. Okay. And I was working hard and I wasn't really uh, thinking about, you know, I, I need to break off and do this for myself. I would, I think there was thoughts of, going into the, uh, I'm a problem solver. People yes. hired me to solve problems. Right. And project management and delivering difficult projects on a deadline and do this and that. So when I had met uh, a couple guys that were also in the finance business, they worked for Deutsche Bank and whatever it is, uh, they were, they would throw investment capital in for different companies and stuff. So they would call me and they would bounce the ideas off certain things and maybe there might be an offer of, uh, hey, would you come in and do this project and do that project? If the offer was good enough, I'd be there. Mm. It wasn't quite good enough. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> but, but I think that, you know, back to your point, uh, learning those things and having a skill set that you can count on, that people count on you to you know, come to you for yeah. uh, input and advice is valuable. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, your friend made uh, probably some great decisions yeah. about, hey, how do I, what can I be successful at based on my knowledge and my skill set? And I think that, you know, he probably said, I can do that. I, I'm working with somebody and I see, I'm seeing them be successful. I can do that too because I can work. Because he was the, approving the loans and analyzing everything yeah. and uh, how much profit they're making, this and that. All the numbers are in front of him. Yeah. All he wanted, he said, all I had to do was hire the right people to fix if the engine broke yeah. in the brake. So I just hired people who yeah. took off, looked after the maintenance of the earth moving equipment. Yeah. I hired people who would go and uh, run them. Yeah. And so you like know, that. your friend was probably a lot smarter than that because I was the guy who was fixing those problems, right? All right. <laughs> <laughs> he could have hired you, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I was the guy who went, you know, went on various those projects to Process, fix things. Right, right. So that kept me busy, or you know, but I did have a, a guy who was telling me, "Hey, how about you go work <laughs> right. and take care of that?" Awesome. So, yeah, that's funny. It was extremely interesting for me. Oh, to you. sit down here in your house and talk about your life and career path. Oh, it was you. an extremely enriching experience. Great. Well, I appreciate you, you, know, you coming to talk to me and uh, it was fun. Glad it was I could fun. do it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.